Tonight's 13th Your Question. Should prosecutors cut a deal with the suspect so the family can find out where Naomi is? Buckle your seatbelts. This hour of closing arguments starts right now. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And you know, on most nights and most trials that we cover here at Court TV involve a murder. And when you're covering a murder case and when you are trying a murder case, you don't have a victim who can come into court and testify. It doesn't happen. So in those cases, you never get the whole story, or at least both sides of a story. Because the person who is the victim doesn't survive. Yes, family members can come in and, and try to bring that person back to life for the jury so they understand that it's a real person and it's a real loss. And sometimes there is other evidence, you know, circumstantial evidence that can, that can piece together what happened there. But you don't have that first person account to give to the jury. Well, today on Court TV, we got that first hand account because it's a case that is not a murder case, but attempted murder. I'm talking about Lauren Canarock, who survived survived getting shot twice in the chest. She made it through. And now, today, she's in the courtroom telling her story to the jury, able to tell them exactly what happened, what she saw, what she heard, what she felt in that moment, and, and what was happening. And she had to be in the room with the man who shot her. Now, I'm not saying allegedly, because in this case, you only have a defense of self-defense. You don't have a defense involving maybe somebody else did it. We know who fired the gun. Michael Barrison is the defendant in this case. A defendant always has a chance to tell their story. Always they have an opportunity to do that. Um, they don't always do it, but their attorney makes the arguments for them. But they always have the option to take the stand and let the jury know their side of the story. So the, the, the great news inside the courtroom in this case of attempted murder is that the jury will have an opportunity to get both sides, to get first-hand accounts. And, and really the question tonight is, will that make it easier for this jury to get to the truth? Because that is their job. As I mentioned, Lauren uh, Kanarak testified today. Let's take a listen. What did you hear him say? I heard him say, um, mostly speaking to Rob at that point, um, you know, I don't want a war. How do I fix this? How, how, how can I make this all better? Was he yelling? No. You know, Michael had been calling the police on us for reasons that we didn't even know why. And not this that it was out of character. Um, for him to act one way one day and then, you know, be nice the next day. But I kind of wanted to know, so I walked over to him and said, how, you know, how do you plan to make this better? How do you, you know, you have a, a bill or some? I was saying something about the bill that he had to settle with Rob, but I didn't get that far because... Why not? The minute I started talking, pretty much, or... Yeah, within the minute I started talking, he pulled out a gun and shot me once, twice, directly in the chest. Put a little bow and I'll throw it to you on the side. All right, for those of you not familiar with the story of this man who was on trial for attempted double murder, Chanley Painter has the story tonight. 
Olympic competitor in the equestrian sport of dressage is standing trial for shooting his student and firing at her fiance. Michael Barrasone faces two counts of attempted murder. As prosecutors say, he shot his trainee, Lauren Canarek, twice in the chest and attempted to shoot her fiance, Rob Goodman, in August 2019. I heard him say, you know, I don't want a war. How do I fix this? How, how, how can I make this all better? At the time of the shooting, Canarek and Goodman lived in the home on Barrisone's farm while Canarek trained with Barrisone in dressage. But in the weeks leading up to the shooting, Barrisone and the couple allegedly started quarreling over landlord-tenant related issues and the relationship allegedly deteriorated to psychological warfare and violence. Prosecutors argue Barrisone intended to kill Canarak and Goodman by borrowing a gun several days before the shootings. I think he does pose a continuing danger, perhaps to himself as well, but certainly to the victims here. The defense argues Barrisone feared for his life as Canarak and Goodman mentally tortured him for months and then on the day of the shooting beat him and had their dog attack him. Nothing further, Judge. Barrisone says he called the police several times to report the couple, but claims the police did nothing. If convicted of attempted murder, Barrisone faces up to life in prison.
I can't wait for you to try it. What a day inside that Morris County, New Jersey courtroom. Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter joining us live tonight uh, to talk about it. Uh, Chanley, so this woman is shot twice by the defendant. Today she's in court testifying against him. They're in the same room. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell me a little bit about her testimony. It was incredible to see. She didn't seem to hesitate at all as she recounted. She lived to tell Vinny. Uh, so she told her story to this jury today in detail what happened August 7, 2019, when she was shot twice. She also gave key context to the months leading up to that shooting, the problems, the conflicts, snowballing between her and the defendant. One thing they both can agree on Benny is that they did not like each other <laughs> very much at all. But when asked why she didn't leave this farm that he owned, that she was living there, she said it was just too difficult to move all of her horses, so she wanted to stay. She didn't leave. She also claimed that the defendant and his girlfriend were bullying her and threatening her in the months leading up to the shooting, and that on that day, Benny, she was simply hanging out on the porch when he walked up and started shooting. But she did acknowledge some of her sort of uh, threatening social media posts that she made about the defendant. She was threatening him. So there's there, there's this, this, this difficult relationship taking place and he's supposed to be training her, right? Mm -hmm. He's an Olympian right. and, was, and training her, but yeah. they just not not getting along. And she's, what, what, what is she doing? What is, what is she? Um, posting about him on social media. Well, she uses the metaphor of king and queen, calling him a king, his girlfriend a queen, and she talks about them wanting wanting to slay them, Vinny, a king and a queen, and about going to war on social media. So the defense on Cross, of course, is taking her through some of these posts that sound very concerning. Let's watch. And in that same post, did you say, can I ask what, what date you're looking at or page or something? This, this is July 12th. Two thousand and nineteen. And at the end of that post, did you say the king has been captured and and killed and the whole entire castle comes crumbling down? Did you say that? Probably. And that sometimes the queen must be sacrificed. Did you say that? Yes. So will you admit, with regards to this post, you were talking about capturing and killing Michael Barrison, with use of metaphors, of course, correct? I was definitely not talking about killing anyone. That would be false. How about sacrificing the queen? Was that Mary Haskins? On a board of chess, where a piece is knocked down, or moved over. Sure. Now, the defense claims that these messages perpetrated the fear in the defendant leading up to the shooting, Vinny. But she, Lauren Canterac, says that no, she was actually the one being targeted, harassed, and bullied living on the farm. She posted this to Facebook I'm being bullied by a six foot three man. Bullied to the point I'm afraid it's very complicated. I'm not sure of what I can say here, but it seems as if safe sport was created for exactly this reason. And of course, Safe Sport Vinny is that organization that you can uh, report allegations of abuse to the Olympic organization. And she did make a complaint about him. This is, this is really strange, strange stuff mm -hmm. because she's supposed to be some sort of a protege. She's supposed to be living there and, and no one's getting along and he ends up shooting her. And he's not denying that he's shooting her, right? No, he doesn't deny it. He just claims that he was mentally at a breaking point and that he was defending himself. They attacked him is what his defense is, Vinny. So, uh, All right. Wow. See. Fascinating dynamics inside that courtroom in my home state in New Jersey. Chanley Painter, thank you so much. Let's bring in our think tank tonight. Joining us in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Eklund Mercy. In Los Angeles, California, former federal prosecutor Nima Romani. And in Phoenix, Arizona, the attorney who represented Jody Arias and the author of the book series, which you need to read, Trapped with Miss Arias, Kirk Nurmi is with us. 
Uh, Nima, I think you're outnumbered tonight because uh, it looks like Eklund and Kirk have coordinated their color. It's, it's kind of a mixture between pink and salmon, but they're out to get you as the former prosecutor. Um, Eklund, what is going on here? Um, he's claiming he's, a, he's somehow a victim, he's afraid, but he's the one with the gun. And by the way, I think his gun matches your glasses because it was pink. <laughs> um. It's unfortunate, but it happens often when you have a person in a position of power. Like we have the issues with coaches or teachers or professors in which they become infatuated with their students. And sometimes if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So we have, uh, apparently we have a, a story of unrequited love um, between the coach and the student. But unfortunately we have a coach who possibly has power, has a has the ability to make or break her career, even in the beginning, even in, in, in its infancy stage. So she's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And then just based on his, um, his characteristic, at his characterization of a Facebook post that probably wasn't even talking to him or talking about him. We have we have some psychological issues. I don't know why they didn't um, file for a psychological evaluation on the defendant here, because that would be the first thing I do. And because we have a victim that's still alive, that's still able to testify, I don't even know why they went to trial with this case, to be real honest. Well, uh, Kirk, your thoughts, is there any defense here to all to all of this because it, it only one you know he's the one with the gun he is the one firing the weapon yes there's some mean posts i guess on social media that he's concerned about but uh she's also concerned and, and reporting him well look if a client says there's self-defense and you can't disprove it one you have to run with it okay i know that all too well but ultimately Vinny. You know, there's something about this case, and you mentioned the bizarre nature of this case. One of the things that I would disagree with Eklund on is, you know, she's posting threatening messages on social media, and he, the defendant, is calling the police. And to me, there's a big difference there. And when I watched her testimony, something just didn't add up. Something just didn't seem right to me. And I don't know if I could put my finger on it, whether it's her body language, whether it was the story. I'm not going to leave because of my horses. She could have came back and got those later. How did the boyfriend wind up on top of him? There were different things that just didn't add up to me. So I could see why this case would go to trial because there is so much evidence. And while the cross-examination could have been more fierce, we saw these posts and they were obviously threatening. So there's a lot more to the story, this bizarre story, as you mentioned, Benny. Well, Anima, let's, let's talk about that. As a prosecutor, are you concerned that this jury may read into this and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, there, 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 this is really strange. There's another dynamic at play here. I don't feel like I'm getting the whole story. Um, and that could be the seeds of reasonable doubt. I am concerned, Vinny. I mean, first I'm concerned that Eklund and Kirk are teaming up behind my back. They're obviously more fashionable than me, but now they're wearing the pink and now I'm numbered in this prosecutor government issued blue. But you know, I know the prosecution is concerned in this case. That's why they offered a 10 year deal on an attempted murder case. I mean, they're lucky that Lauren is alive after getting shot twice in the chest. I, there's obviously these Facebook messages you know, he's outnumbered two to one. And look, we've seen it in the last two big cases we've covered on court TV. We Reeves there in Florida, the victim was armed with nothing but a cell phone and some popcorn, obviously Rittenhouse, everyone's talking about. So you never know what a jury is going to do in a self-defense case. And those two cases were outright acquittal. So I think the defense does have some cards to play with here, Vinny. All right, we shall see. Uh, it, it continues tomorrow. Meanwhile, there was another woman taking the stand on court TV today, but in a different city, in a different courtroom uh, in Nashville. This is the case against Michael Mosley. He is accused of stabbing three people, killing two people in a barroom fight, uh, somehow focused around uh, a woman that Michael Mosley was, uh, according to the testimony that I heard, was hitting on that night, who was with another group. There's video of everything that happened, but th there was something that happened today. Another woman who took the stand who's actually a friend of the defendant, a friend of the defendant, and I saw her on the stand today. She was shaking. She didn't want to be in that courtroom testifying against her friend, but she did because she was subpoenaed 
And she had to get up there and tell the truth and talk about why the defendant was inside that bar that night. Do you remember making a statement about Poppy and the reason why you went to Dogwood Bar? Yeah, I mean, he What did you say? Said that there, I mean, there would be potential buyers. Um, I am. Um, if that's what you're referring to, yes, I said that. Okay, potential buyers for the drugs he was trying to sell. Yes. Okay. When you got to Dogwood Bar, did you, Michael Mosley, Daniel, and Poppy go into the bar? Yes. What did you do when you got to, into the bar? Uh, we went and ordered a drink. Okay. And did y'all mingle around and talk to people who were there? Yes. Did you see anybody who was in your group participate in trying to sell drugs? I seen them with an individual. I'm assuming that may have had something to do with it, but I don't know exactly. You have a response. Your Honor, I can direct Ms. Harper to answer with what she saw. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you tell the jury what you saw that would be um, that would sh that would be consistent with somebody who was selling drugs? Um, if no foundation that she understands the basics of selling drugs, Your Honor. Yeah, you may want to I'll sustain objection. Refer to the question. Well, can you just tell the jury what you saw? I just saw them mingling with people what are the basics of selling drugs by the way <laughs> all right uh, let, let's bring in court tv legal correspondent julie janae she's live in nashville tennessee tonight uh julia great to see you one thing i noticed about uh and her name is, is, is jc harper who was on the witness stand there she was shaking she was well, now do we and, and I don't know the way the jury's going to read this, but there's different, different ways you could take it. She's shaking because she's got to testify against this guy accused of murder, or she's just generally nervous, or, or there's something else going on. Uh, what can you tell us about J.C. Harper and her testimony today? Well, we know she was certainly nervous. I had the chance to talk to her after she testified. She said that she just wanted to get up there and tell the truth. And she was someone who not only was there with her friend inside of that bar room, but she was also in the thick of the fight. She was in the middle of it, saying that she was just trying to keep these two different groups away from each other. She felt responsible for Michael Mosley. She said she was always looking out for him because she was actually friends first with his brother who was killed years ago. So she wanted to keep him on the right path. There they are on surveillance video play fighting. She said that was the them playing around like they always did and show that they were just there to have a good time. That video is actually what was released to the public in 2019 to help them find the suspect when they didn't know where he was. But here's a listen to some of our interview with her today that the defense may use to prove their self-defense case even if the defendant doesn't take the stand. It was scary, I mean, for sure, because, I mean, I had dropped my wallet, so I, I had, of course, got leaned down to get it and then when I looked up I seen my friend surrounded by a bunch of giants is what they looked like to him compared to him I mean and I just tried my best to defuse the situation I feel like he felt he needed to defend himself I mean he had quite a few much bigger people on him and I can't tell you what made him choose what he chose but I guess that's for him to say. I know after you testified, there was a moment, a tender moment outside in the hallway here um, that came from an unlikely source, the father of one of the stabbing victims, Clay Bethard's dad. What did he say to you and what did it mean to you when you heard it? Um, he just thanked me for showing up today in court and telling the truth and the whole truth about everything I knew and trying to defuse the situation at hand that night and then he of course told me if, if there ever was a, a time that I talked to Michael again which of course there will be that he wanted me to relay a message to him that you know he's forgiven him and that he hopes he finds God and finds a new direction whether it be on the street or in prison. 
And J.C. Harper there, she said she wants people to know that Mosley's not a monster and that he's been going through a lot since the death of his brother many years back. The prosecution today, Vinny, said they want a jury instruction that's on self-defense, but they wanted crafted and detailed based on her testimony because at this point that's what has been put forth by the defense and the defense says they doubt they're going to put Mosley on the stand. Wow. Uh, one more quick question. Was there any significance to prosecutors trying to establish that um, the defendant was in there buying and selling drugs in the bar? There's significance to it that the prosecution wants to be able to tell this jury that he was engaged in unlawful activity. And under the Tennessee statute, if you are engaged in unlawful activity, then you don't get to stand your ground when you're the primary aggressor. You have the duty to try and retreat. And they've been drawing out that there may have been opportunities for Mosley to retreat. So that's why they really wanted to get out that possible drug transaction testimony through Harper. She told me uh, it really wasn't something that she saw. She thinks it was something that she was persuaded into telling authorities early on and then had to corroborate it today in court. Julie Janae in Nashville, thank you so much. Trial continuing down there. Let's bring back in our think tank. Um, this is a, a fascinating turn in everything, uh, Nima. Prosecutors trying to establish that Mosley's in there selling drugs, which has nothing to do with the fight and the stabbing, but trying to use that to make it less viable of a defense that it was self-defense by Mosley. Um, number one, do you think that's do you think that's fair to bring in something that's unrelated to what 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 the fight was about to use to uh, diffuse the self-defense claim? It's fair if the judge allows it in, Vinny, and the judge has allowed it in. So kudos to the prosecution for dirtying up Mosley even more. Look, let's be real. Here's someone who cannot testify. He's already doing 12 years for a previous assault. He's got a rap sheet a mile long. I know the Well, can we talk about that assault real quick? I just want to remind people what that assault was. It was all on video also. It was inside a Walmart. He attacked a woman. But the woman yeah. had been accused of murdering his brother. It's, it's really a, a layered, complicated life that Mosley's been living. Uh, but, I, but again, no excuse for stabbing three people and killing two. Go ahead, Neem, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I don't expect him to testify in this case. I mean, the defense is going to be based on the surveillance video, and there's so much of it from different angles. Even though Barrisow, in the case we talked about previously, he's going to take the stand. Defendants in self-defense cases typically do. I don't expect Mosley to do so. So what the prosecution needs to do is to negate that self-defense argument through all the witnesses. And one of the key themes here is, first, he brought a knife to a fist fight. And second, he had many opportunities to flee. And when did he flee? After he stabbed and killed two people and injured a third and was at large for four days. So very different conduct than the other self-defense cases that we've been talking about, Vinny. Yeah, Kirk, let me, let me ask you about the scenario, right? Um, and we heard it uh, from Julia's interview from J.C. Harper and the, and the jury's seen the video, that he uh, is surrounded by three guys who are bigger than he is. He's not a big guy, he's a small guy. Um, gets into a lot of fights, though, apparently. I, I've seen him on video fight at least twice now. Um, is that enough? If, if he starts the physical confrontation, are you allowed to use a physical confrontation if three guys are around you? Or do you can you, can you go you know, straight to fighting at that moment and start the physical confrontation? Um, or do you have to wait for someone to actually physically attack you to claim self-defense? I think this is what the jury's going to struggle with. Well, yeah, I do think it's what the jury might struggle with, but keep in mind, uh, he's just standing there against taller people. That's not a license to start defending yourself because there's taller people around you. So that in and of itself, if they were doing something that was threatening, what have you, maybe. But we don't have any evidence of that. Even his friend, even the interview with Julia, she talked about he was surrounded by giants. Okay, that's great, but that doesn't give him the right to react the way he did. So I don't see this self-defense claim really going anywhere. We can see the videos. He's got a friend testifying against him, and he really, for the reasons Nima stated in the videos we're showing right now, can't testify in his own defense. So the way I see this trial, it's what I've said before. It's one of these long-form guilty pleas, Vinny, that ultimately is going to wind up in, in a guilty verdict. You know, it's interesting, and I think we need to, re I mean, we always have to uh, reveal the information you're talking about surrounded by giants i mean kirk nermy how tall are you 
I'm about 6'4", Vinny. But yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. And, so and take it with a grain of salt, folks, when he's talking about being surrounded by big guys, right? Right. You know, and I was watching the Reeves trial, and I thought, geez, that defense gives me the idea that I can be shot at a movie theater because I'm 6'4". <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I, but, it, but it worked. It worked in that case. Eklund Mercy, your thoughts about the self-defense here. Everything's on video for the jury, but it's, they're, they're silent movies. So you need the testimony to, to get more context into what is being said in the moment. I, I honestly think it's going to be all the way down to closings because the, the attorney that can really, like, they have to teach a class in this closing. You're going to have to teach criminal law 101, criminal procedure 101 in this closing because it's that detailed, it's that nuanced. And you have to go to every single video and you essentially have to teach that class. And the one that is the most clear, the most eloquent, that's who's going to win. Unfortunately, a case like this always boils down to the last thing that they heard. All right, we shall see. All right, they're staying with us. Ekla Mercy, Nima Romani, Kirk Nurmi. When we come back, we've got a lot more to get to. Still ahead. On the docket tonight in Lyon County, Nevada, 18-year-old Naomi Arian has been missing since March 12th. The man accused of abducting her at a Walmart parking lot was in court for the first time. We need news. We need to find her. We need to know. Plus, Naomi Arian has been missing since March 12th. Her family is desperate to find her. And the man who abducted her has been arrested but is not cooperating. Tonight's 13th year question. Should prosecutors cut a deal with the suspect so the family can find out where Naomi is?
we're all feeling very on edge and keyed up uh, because we need news. We need to find her. We need to know. Um, but we're also really scared that it's the wrong person and that we won't, we have to start the process all over again from the beginning. It's uh, the, the height of the emotion is, it's, it's wrenches your chest apart and makes you feel like you're having a heart attack and you're about to die. On the docket tonight, the case of Troy Driver. Before we get to Troy Driver, let me get to the real story here. That was Diana Arion. Her daughter is missing. Her daughter, Naomi, just 18 years old, missing out of a town called Fernley, Nevada. It's close to Reno. It's kind of in that part of the state. Um, Naomi was spotted on surveillance video at a convenience store. There you see it. Uh, before she took her car to the Fernley Walmart, and she would go there early in the morning, super early in the morning. She would park because she had to catch a shuttle bus to go to work at uh, Panasonic. So hardworking young woman, um, her, her mom talked to us at length. And what, what, a, what a great spirit uh, Naomi is as well. Uh, but while she was in that parking lot waiting, uh, someone else was caught on surveillance video, the man in this gray hoodie. And investigators told us that he abducted her, went into her car and abducted her. Naomi is now missing. But the man in the gray hoodie, they found him. They tracked him down. There he is, Troy Driver. That's him. He was arrested in connection with the abduction of Naomi. He's been charged, and he appeared in court via Zoom today for his bail hearing. The judge set bail at $750,000 if he makes bail. He won't be released until after he is set up with GPS monitoring. Um, he is not to contact the Aryan family, and he will be uh, placed on enhanced supervision that will require him to check in daily if he gets released. Because they said, Bond, hasn't been charged with murder. Not charged with murder in this case. But now he's in custody. And the family is absolutely desperate to find Naomi. Let's bring back in our think tank, Eklund Mercy, Nima Romani, Kirk Nurmi with us. Um, Kirk, I want you to take us behind the curtain a little bit here. Okay. Troy Driver gets arrested. Um, they assign him counsel. He meets with his attorney. What's that meeting like? What, what's taking place? What are they talking about? Well, that depends on how open and forthcoming Mr. Driver is. But they're talking about what happened giving them as much detail as possible. And of course, that attorney, and people aren't going to like to hear this, are going to want to, to tell the defendant not to talk, not to be quiet, not to talk with investigators, not to say anything at this point in time, because those are his rights and he cannot better his situation absent some sort of deal until he, you know, absent some sort of cooperation agreement. So he is best served saying nothing. Eklund Mercy, you meet with Troy Driver. You understand the nature of the case. He's on video. He's accused of abducting a woman who has not been found. Uh, what do you want to know from him as his attorney? Uh, what does he want to do? Like, uh, do are we going to trial or are we looking for a plea deal? And that's up to him because they, they essentially know what they want to do. Um, and a practice pointer, ladies, if you are driving, if you're in a dark parking lot, please check your car before getting into the car. Look in the back, look in the um, back seat. If you have tinted windows, please check your car before entering a car because we have a kidnapping. We don't have a murder case. So at that point, it's going to be up to Troy. Now, if I, um, I've never been a prosecutor, but I would hope that the prosecutor would provide a deal. And I know that a defense attorney would be able to at least get some information um, if the deal was like, if the deal made sense. Nima Romani, you are the former prosecutor. This is frustrating. He's not cooperating. There is a lot of pressure. The family is Desperate, desperate. Let me let me play for you, Nima, before you answer. 
uh, Diana Arian. She was on our show the other night. Take a listen. To my daughter's kidnapper, you need to tell us where she is. Things will go much better for you if we find her safe and alive because this case is very big and agencies all the way up to the highest level in the federal government are paying attention to this. And if you do not give up her location, the weight that will fall on you is severe. You must give up my daughter's location. Please give my daughter back to me, please. <laughs> Okay, Nima Romani is a prosecutor. How do you handle this whole situation? Heartbreaking, Vinny, to see Naomi's mom's video and credit to the FBI for the bang up job on this investigation. Here's what's gonna happen, there are three possibilities. And I sit down with Eklund or Kirk or whoever's there. The first and the best case scenario is that driver provides a location and Naomi is found alive. You know me, I don't like discounts, but I give a very significant discount because her life is much more important than putting driver away. Second, there's another deal. If he provides Naomi's location, she's dead and he pleads. You give a very small discount just for giving the family some closure. And if he doesn't cooperate at all, guess what Vinny, I'm taking his case to trial. He's already been convicted once of accessory after the fact to murder here in California. He's done 12 years. He knows what state prison time is. And I make sure he spends the rest of his life in prison if he doesn't play ball. Kirk Nurmi, um, do you, you know, as you, as you mentioned, each defendant is different in, in how they respond. And, and do you try to how do you take, a, let's say Nima brings that to you, those scenarios, how do you then bring that to your client? Do you wanna know the truth? Do you want him to tell you exactly what happened and what he knows and, and, and where she is if, if in fact he has that information? You know, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, but I would be very frank with him. I would tell him exactly, I'd say, okay, Nima's a very capable prosecutor. And of course, this is the evidence he has. This is what's gonna happen. And if you don't cooperate and she is dead, this is what is going to happen. He's gonna pursue life term. <laughs> And then, then you judge their reaction because like you said, every defendant is different. This is serious. They believe you committed murder. Your only chance is to talk. If you wanna talk, that's fine. If you don't, I can't force you, but you know the consequences because my belief is, yeah, you should do something to help the family and help yourself. But if you're not gonna to wanna to do it, I obviously can't force you and you've made that decision and you understand the consequences. All right, um, we've got a pretrial hearing coming up in this case. It's happening on April 5th, Nevada versus Troy Driver. Meanwhile, the search for Naomi continues. If you have any information, folks, please uh, pick up the phone and, and call the FBI, call 911, call anyone uh, with that information. When we come back, I posted this scenario on social media for you today. And, and really the question is, do you believe prosecutors should cut a sweet deal for Troy Driver to give the family the information, the answer they want, regardless of what that information is and regardless of what happened to Naomi? Your verdict next.
4136. We're looking for information that directly brings Naomi back home to us, period. Um, and if that also lets prosecution happen, great. If not, you know, it, it, it's not something I can worry about. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the people that are involved in this, you know, they're going to get what they deserve one way or the other. That's the way the universe works most of the time. <laughs> So, um, you know, all I, all I care about is bringing Naomi home. That was Casey Valley. That is Naomi Arian's brother who joined us uh, on, on the program. And, and he was really clear and it really uh, made an impact on me as a former prosecutor. Him talking about, I don't, I don't care about the prosecution. I care about my sister. I want her home. I want her back. And it really highlights a... a, a an ethical issue that prosecutors are going to have to deal with in this case and, and similar cases, which is you've got a family desperate, you have an opportunity here to maybe get them their answer, but it's going to cost you by giving this potential killer, potential hasn't been charged, but potential killer, a sweet deal. So post it on social media asking you, do you think that deal should be cut? 13th juror comment of the day comes from Susan who says, Bringing her home is what the family needs, whether the outcome is good or not. If it was my kid, I would want a plea deal. If he gave up the location to the family, that is the most important thing, not the punishment for what he has uh, done. That is secondary. Nima Romani, um, do you agree? Is it about the family first and the punishment second? I agree with Susan Vinny, and it's about human life and that family and preserving human life. I don't know if Driver was acting by himself. I don't know if Naomi was alive, but if he can, if he can somehow bring her back, I don't give him a walk, but I'm talking a major discount. You know, if you want numbers, maybe instead of 25, he's doing five. You know, something that is so significant that any reasonable person would give up the location of Naomi. Glenda tonight. No way. Do the crime, suffer the consequences. I want the family to get her back, but not at the expense of some other family who could this happen to. And, Kirk, that's the issue for prosecutors, right? I mean, you give a sweetheart deal here, he maybe gets out, uh, you know, and then maybe there's another family that gets victimized. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that is the exact moral dilemma we're grappling with here. But if we really want to concern ourselves with the here and now, the only case we can really deal with is that of Naomi. We can hear the heartbreak in the voice of the brother and the mother. So I think we really need to focus on that reality. And as Nima said, look, he's not getting a, a free pass, maybe five years instead of 25. And I, Glenda's point is well taken, and that's why there's a dilemma. But I think we really have to deal with the here and now and and, and do as Nima suggested in terms of making a deal. Sue tonight, the deal can't be so good he is back on the streets to do this to another family. However, the family needs to have some answers. So some deal should be met for the sake of the missing girl. Um, how difficult, Eklund, is it to get someone to agree to voluntarily spend, whether it's five, ten years in prison? Well, you know, um, Naomi's mom said something very, very, very poignant in the, in the first part in which she said, we need to make sure that he's the one who did it. So a lot of it is riding on the investigation by the prosecutor. Do you have the right person? Let's make sure that we have the right person. And if we do, if you're giving him a sweetheart deal five years you're good. So I think that the ball actually goes back to the prosecutor to get as much information as they can and then offer the deal to like really show, hey, we can proceed with trial, but we're giving you this deal, not because we don't have the evidence, but because time is of the essence. All right. And time is of the essence. You hear the band playing. Eklund Mercy, Nima Romani, Kirk Nurmi. Awesome, as always. Thank you so much for your insight and perspective tonight. We really, really needed it. Uh, when we come back, folks, big news in the Delphi murders, Libby and Abby. Major information revealed next.
Monster.com. In Delphi, Indiana, big news in the unsolved murders of Libby German and Abby Williams. Documents uncovered by podcasters reveal the connection between the victims and a man arrested on child pornography and exploitation charges. How close is this case to being solved? Detectives are seeking information about the person who created the Anthony Schatz profile. In tonight's Unsolved Case File in Nashville, Tennessee, Patrick Burdine moved to Music City to pursue a career in entertainment. But in 2015, his dreams ended when he was brutally murdered. Now, seven years later, his mom is still searching for justice. And I have this saying that I've told many friends, it's okay to visit those dark places, but you can't stay there. In Pasco County, Florida, some tense moments as a motorist is stopped in his own neighborhood trying to get home. We take a look at the testy exchange with our own law enforcement experts. When he hit the thing, I completed my stop, and he gets out with an attitude. And in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a shootout in the streets followed by a violent crash of a stolen car. We break down what happened during crime time. Buckle your seatbelts. This hour of closing arguments starts right now. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And believe it or not, it's been more than five years now that two young girls went missing in a small town in Indiana. They were found murdered, and the case still hasn't been solved. And, and for years, um, more information has been coming out, little drips and drabs, and it seems like we're so close to solving this case. I'm talking about the case of Abby Williams and Libby German, two young, young girls. I mean, it was a brutal, brutal case, and it seems like there's a lot of evidence, and it seems like we should have this thing pretty much wrapped up. We've got big news tonight that reveals even more information that makes it even, or, or makes it seem like we have the information. Why is no one in handcuffs? And then I wanna work our way through all of that tonight. We have some great guests joining us in just a moment. Uh, but first, uh, for those of you who don't know the backstory, um, Rafael Sanchez, great, great reporter from our affiliate WRTV in Indianapolis has more. The deaths of Abby Williams and Libby German remain unsolved. February 14th, 2022 will mark five years since the teens' bodies were found near the old Monon High Bridge in Delphi in Carroll County. Due to the ongoing investigation, state police always said that this was not a cold case and it produced a new lead. State police investigators now looking for an individual using the name Anthony underscore shots on Instagram and Snapchat between 2016 and 2017. The individual used the pictures of a real life model as his own. The model seen in these photographs is not involved in this matter, but his pictures were used to reach young girls to get nude images or to get their address to meet them. Detectives are seeking information about the person who created the Anthony Schatz profile. Investigators would like any individual who communicated, met, or attempted to meet the Anthony Schatz profile to contact law enforcement by utilizing the tip email, Abby and Libby Tip at CACOSHRF.com. Please provide as much information as you possibly can. The tip lines have been overwhelmed since this sketch was released back in 2017 of the man who allegedly says down the hill on the bridge. In 2019, state police updated the sketch, creating new interest in getting the public to help. Now a new piece of information is before a legion of people being asked to give this case one more minute. All right, again, this is still unsolved. Nobody has been arrested for this. No one's been charged. So if you have information, we've got a tip line for you, 844-459-5786. There's also an email address as well. But please make that call. And we're going to talk about 
why it hasn't been solved and how close investigators may be, but every piece of evidence is going to help them. Now, let me walk through this little part at the end you heard, this Anthony Sh This was the bizarre twist that was recently revealed. Um, this Anthony Schatz profile that was, that was posted, and they're trying to figure it out. Now, the male model has nothing to do with it. The picture is like catfishing, right? You use someone else's picture to attract people because you look nothing like this person. Um, the person who is connected to this Anthony Schatz is, is a guy named Kagan Klein. There he is. Doesn't look anything like that model. Looks nothing like him. You know why uh, he didn't put his own picture up there. Now, this is a 27-year-old man from Peru, Indiana. He's been arrested on 30 counts of child solicitation, child exploitation, and possession of child pornography. In a new transcript of his August 2020 interview with police, um, some information is revealed. And I have to give you the backstory, a little bit of the backstory of this, this um, transcript. Uh, unbelievably, the producers of a podcast, it's called The Murder Sheet, Phenomenal podcast. You need to download it. Um, download it tonight after the show. Um, but they got their hands on this transcript because it was posted momentarily by the Miami County, Indiana clerk of court on March 3rd. Let me read for you something from this interview. Again, this is this guy, uh, Kagan Klein, who's arrested for all these uh, awful things, but not arrested for murder, not charged with murder. In the interview, he's asked... I know you remember Liberty German, uh, uh, inaudible. Right, and, and you know you talked to her and you admitted to talking to her and the answer from him, I don't think I ever did though. I, I think I talked to one of her friends like I told them and then the question from the interrogator, you, you admitted that you talked to her, inaudible. Another question, for a few hours at a sleepover and then you blocked her because she was annoying. You remember that? You're right, yeah. Another part of this transcript. I'm telling you, that's the, I'm telling you that's the fact you did, okay? Because the Anthony Schatz persona, the fake account, the answer, right, that um, admitted to making communications with Liberty German on Snapchat, on Instagram, like I said, it was not just for a couple of hours. So now a connection, a connection between a man involved with child pornography and exploitation communicating with one of those little girls. Unbelievable development. Unbelievable development. Let's bring in our guests. I said I have good ones tonight. We always have good ones. We have great ones. In Jacksonville, Alabama, professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University, forensic media analyst, former senior investigator for the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office, Joseph Scott Morgan is with us. In Chicago, Illinois, private investigator Erica Morse. And in Indianapolis, Indiana, the Murder Sheet Podcasters. I told you about the podcast. Download it tonight. Anya Kane and Kevin Greenlee are with us. Uh, welcome to everyone. We've got some time to go through this. Uh, but Anya and, and Kevin, um, you guys decide who's going to talk. I'll just throw some questions at, at you. I know you're used to working together. How, give us, a, again, the backstory on getting your hands on this, this um, transcript and, and the significance of this transcript. Well, there's a website in Indiana where courts uh, upload uh, documents and filings, and we've been covering this case pretty closely. So periodically we go to the page for Kagan Klein's case, and I happened to go there on this day during the brief window that those documents were there. I immediately downloaded them, and once I started reading them, I was shocked at what I was reading because there were a number of personal details that I would have expected to have been redacted. So then I went back uh, to the page, and I saw that it had already been removed. Wow. Okay. So give, give, me, give me the big picture, okay? You read through the transcript, the big picture that you're, you're following this case. You are knee-deep into every detail that's been dripping out for years now. Um, what is your big picture takeaway from this transcript? Basically, we're finally learning what exactly the connection is between this mysterious Anthony Schatz account that was apparently preying on young girls and the Delphi case. 
So it's sort of this horrific connection now that we know that Liberty German uh, was seemingly communicating with whoever was running the Anthony Schatz account right before her murder. So it's this very disturbing twist, but it finally sort of puts together what the connection is there. Now, we can't forget, this is a case where there have been sketches. There's a video. There's audio. All of this released. But as we sit here tonight, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Anya and Kevin, that the man that we saw, this Kagan, who's being interviewed about the Anthony Schatz um, profile and the, and the, and the contact uh, with, with Liberty, one of the little girls, still, he is not, he's not been arrested for the murder. He is, he's not been arrested for the murder. He's not been implicated as, yeah, he's the guy in the video. He's the guy in the audio. That's correct. He's not been arrested for the murder. Right now, he's facing a variety of charges related to child sexual abuse materials. And he's also facing a charge of obstruction of justice because the phone that he would have been using at the time of the murders to communicate with the girls or anyone else he did not turn over to police when he was supposed to. He uh, kept it from police, and prior to turning it over to police, he deleted all of his social media accounts, which would have contained uh, any communications he had with Liberty German. Wow. Wow. Okay, I want to read another part from the transcript. And then we're going to bring in Joseph Scott Morgan and Erica Morse. All right, question. She said, did you hear about Liberty? You respond on Anthony Schatz, OMG, what happened? That's talking to someone about the two girls that were missing and wound up dead. Right, I, I guess you're right, yeah, is the, is the answer. Okay, the same person or the girl that you were talking to says that Anthony Schatz was meeting up with Liberty German. Same conversation of the OMG, what happened? Anthony Schatz says, yeah, we were supposed to meet, but she never showed up. The answer, that's a lie. That's a lie. Um, before I bring you in, Joseph Scott Morgan, Erica Morse, to react to all of this. Anya, Kevin, can you give me a little more context to what I just read? It's a little confusing. It sounds like they're talking about some other conversation here. Absolutely. Um, apparently, the Anthony Schatz account was in communication with uh, one of Libby's friends, who basically, in the wake of the murders, reached out to this uh, Anthony Schatz account and basically said, have you heard what happened to our mutual friend? This is this is horrible. And the Anthony Schatz account responded with this like very suspicious response, essentially saying, we were supposed to meet up on the day of the murders, but she never showed up. So a very odd exchange. Joseph Scott Morgan. Your reaction to these new revelations, thanks to our friends at the Murder Sheet podcast. Yeah, uh, you know, we we starve for any bit of information that we can get on this case, Finn. And to take you back to Thursday, February 23rd, 2017, we were told at that particular time by the authorities that we had DNA evidence from the scene. And now that an individual that is of interest now has been identified. I'd be kind of interested, and particularly given all of this peripheral information that's coming in, I'd be very interested to know if there has been any forward movement relative to pairing up the unknown with the known at this point in time. Maybe things are starting to fall into place. Maybe you know this, uh, this interwoven tapestry, if you will, of all these little segments that we've been looking at for so long uh, from a great distance, maybe, maybe, maybe the focus is coming in a little bit tighter now. I certainly hope so, Ben. Erica Morris, private investigator in Chicago. I know you have followed this case intently. Um, I'm a former prosecutor. I know that when investigators deliver that case, I want to make sure I dot the I's, I cross the T's, because I have that incredible burden that we see every day on Court TV beyond any and all reasonable doubt. What are your thoughts tonight, Erica Morse, as to why we are sitting here knowing what we know now that investigators have known for quite some time and we still don't have an arrest? I'm not surprised. 
Um, and I, I think we're still going to be okay. Um, first of all, I just have to say kudos to this podcasting team because as a reporter and an investigator in the Hoosier State, I cannot believe this landed on my case. Good for you for catching it. It's amazing because the minute you said database, I figured out where you got it and it blows my mind that it ever landed there. Um, second, um, 108,000, uh, Vindy, that's a number I'm going to toss out to you. 12 years of my life investigating and trying to prove that one person used a computer to access child pornography and other deviant images. This is a shared device in a, in a household. So the fact that we have Keegan Klein in custody is a miracle in and of itself. I, it's my understanding that the podcasters got law enforcement permission or at least um, checked in with them before releasing this information. That tells me that law enforcement is already ahead of the ball on this and that they didn't fear that the releasing of these documents would interfere with their current investigation. Um, investigations like this evolve. And we've seen multiple sketches. We've seen one person of interest from 2017 shift into a later person of interest. I think that everyone in that household is suspect in one form or another. And when they deliver this case to the prosecutor, they want this to be ironclad. Um, this is one of the best, if not the best task forces I've ever seen for murdered children. And I'm not at all surprised that they are taking their time. They are probably working diligently behind the, case, or behind the scenes. And this case is already very solid. They just have to finalize it and put it together so they can present it. Okay, all guests are staying with us. When we come back, Erica mentioned about that household and devices. We're going to try to get some more information about what devices were communicating uh, before the murder of these two beautiful young girls. We'll be right back.
smiledirectclub.com. That is audio purportedly of the of the murderer of Libby and Abby, those two girls in Delphi, Indiana. A big news tonight as um, the Murder Sheet podcast got their hands on a transcript, got the okay to to publish it all, and now we have more information. Uh, and it seems that investigators are much much closer to solving this case than we thought just a few weeks ago. Um, I want to read another piece of this transcript and it all has to do with devices and and how many devices are connected to this Anthony Schatz profile which was which was interacting with one of the little girls who was murdered so here's the question this is a uh, uh, Keegan Kagan Klein is being interrogated uh, by investigators he's asked what what we want to know is who had access to the Anthony Schatz account the answer from Klein, me, on two different devices, yes. At the same time, yeah. So if you are the sole owner of that account, the only one that had access to it, I mean, on those days, that just looks like me logging into one of my phones. I was logged in on that phone. I logged out, logged in on my other phone. That's what that looks like. Wait a minute, what's going on here? Let's bring back in our guests. Still with us, Professor of Forensics at Jacksonville State University, Justice Scott Morgan, Private Investigator Erica Morse, and the Murder Sheet Podcasters, Anya Kane, Kevin Greenlee. I keep reminding you, download that podcast after the show tonight. All right, Anya and Kevin, give me some context here again. Two devices coming from the same home. Who's in this house? Who potentially has access to all of this other than Kagan Klein? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, as, our, as we understand it, uh, the only people living in that household as of 2017 were Kagan Anthony Klein and his uh, father, Jerry Anthony Klein. So those two individuals were living in the house together in Peru, Indiana. And um, one thing investigators keep asking Kagan throughout this whole interview is, is it possible that anybody else had access to some of your devices and your Anthony Schatz profile? And again, that's significant because it's from that profile that someone is contacting Libby. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's correct. And in, in the transcript, they also mentioned that a friend of Liberty Germans informed the police that Liberty German was very interested in Anthony Schatz. I believe the word they used was that she was enthralled by Anthony Schatz and that she had expressed an interest in meeting Anthony Schatz. The pieces are coming together here, but the, the missing piece is who, is there anyone else in, in play here potentially that had access to these devices? Because it's a phone, a phone can go anywhere, um, or, or a password can go anywhere. Was there anyone else, uh, uh, Kevin or Anya? Yeah, um, it's interesting. Uh, in, in the transcript, Kagan Anthony uh, Klein keeps throwing a friend of his uh, under the bus. We redacted that name and referred to him as a friend one in our show, uh, because police don't seem to think he was involved. But he basically makes the claim that um, he would get very drunk or, or high rather and pass out and that perhaps this friend slash roommate stole his phone. And I think the investigators do a really good job of sort of picking apart that narrative by saying basically like, so you would constantly, you know, pass out in front of this friend and he would steal your phone to do download child sexual abuse materials. Like, really, is that you know, is that a realistic story? But that's Kagan's story, at least. And the only other person that lived in the house was Kagan's father, Tony Klein, who has quite an interesting criminal history of his own. Wow. All right. Now, again, we were showing those pictures. That was from the profile. It was a catfish profile. That male model who's in those pictures has nothing to do with what happened to these girls. He was used to lure the victims. Uh, Joseph Scott Morgan, I'm scratching my head here. And the reason I'm scratching my head is we've got a video, right? Don't we have a video of the purported killer? We've got 
the device that is communicating that it wants to meet Libby. We know Libby is enthralled with Anthony's shots, and we've got two people living in the house. We can't, we can't put this all together yet? Well, it would seem that uh, the authorities are taking their time, at least in our view. Remember, we're, we're not on the inside looking at this, and it's, it's very, very complex. I think one other little wrinkle here that's, that's troubling for me, Vin, is the fact that uh, this one fellow that is currently in custody has been charged with these horrendous crimes. And what we do know about perpetrators like this is that they generally network with one another quite a bit. And I'm really wondering if there are others that might be involved and might have knowledge that would be connected or interconnected within this web of sharing images and these sorts of things. And it would have to be, in my estimation at least, someone that would be within easy uh, driving uh, distance to Delphi. Delphi is a very isolated area. And so, you know, you begin to kind of focus in on these individuals that might be interconnected with this individual. And that might be part of this as the police are taking their time kind to weave all of this together. Okay, uh, we're out of time for tonight. But I hope, um, Anya, Kevin, you'll come on again because this story is continuing uh, to develop and there's so much more to get to. We appreciate your time tonight. Erica Morris, Joseph Scott Morgan are staying with us because uh, when we come back, it is time to open up tonight's Unsolved Case File. We've got a lot to get to still ahead. In tonight's Unsolved Case File in Nashville, Tennessee, Patrick Burdine moved to Music City to pursue a career in entertainment. But in 2015, his dreams ended when he was brutally murdered. Now, seven years later, his mom is still searching for justice. And I have this saying that I've told many friends, it's okay to visit those dark places, but you can't stay there. In Pasco County, Florida, some tense moments as a motorist is stopped in his own neighborhood trying to get home. We take a look at the testy exchange with our own law enforcement experts. When he hit the thing, I completed my stop, and he gets out with an attitude.
Call our helpline now. I'm Betty Politan. Welcome back. And it's time now to open up tonight's unsolved case file. And this is where we are literally asking for your help. These are cases that um, the answer hasn't come. The arrest has not been made. And justice has not been delivered to the victims. So please pay close attention. And if you have information, pick up the phone tonight. Um, Emily Luxon from our great affiliate in Nashville, WTVS tonight, has our story. Um, it's, it's, the, it's a brutal murder uh, of, a, of, of someone who moved to Nashville. Patrick Burdine is his name. Wanted to be in the entertainment business. I get it. I get it. You know, and, and all of his dreams and, and his future just cut way too short. Let's take a look. Patrick Burdine was happiest when he was in the spotlight. The first show that I went to, I was just completely in awe. The 28-year-old moved from Jackson to Nashville to pursue his passion for makeup, dance, and performing. His mom says the last time he was on stage, there was plenty to celebrate. By the time the show was over, he had about 60-something calls from all over the United States wanting him to come to perform in their city. Nine days later, on July 27, 2015, one of Patrick's neighbors at the Horizon Park Apartments on Packard Drive called police after hearing several gunshots. When officers arrived, they found Patrick unresponsive inside his apartment. Metro Police Detective Matthew Filter says someone shot Patrick multiple times, and he died a short time later. Whatever happened, happened inside the apartment, and considering the, the, that the door was locked, or the apartment was all locked up, we believe that he, he obviously knew who his attacker was. One of the biggest clues police have to go on is a witness saw a man who was about 5'10", with no shirt and white pants, running from the scene after the shooting. Now investigators say they need someone to come forward with more details. We know that there's people out there that have information that know about what happened, or who Mr. Burdon would have been with, or who would have been over at his apartment at that time. But with no new leads, Patrick's mom is still waiting to find out who killed her son. While she continues to grieve, she relies on the support of family and friends, but most importantly, her faith. And I have this saying that I've told many of friends, it's okay to visit those dark places, but you can't stay there. So it's God that helps me come out of it. Despite the loss, there is still hope closure and justice for Patrick will come. This case can be solved. It's just a matter of getting a few people to cooperate with us. It would mean a lot to me on this earth here, before I leave here, to know that those guys are behind bars. Somebody knows something. 615-862-7329. That is the Nashville Metro Police Cold Case Unit. It's time to heat up this cold case, folks. Please, you heard something. Somebody told somebody and you overheard something. Make the call. Make the call tonight. Okay, still with us tonight. Professor of Forensics at Jacksonville State University Forensic Media Analyst Joseph Scott Morgan, private investigator Erica Morse, and joining us now in Jackson, Tennessee, very special guest, Patrick's mother, Glenda Bonds, is with us. Glenda, first of all, uh, our thoughts are with you. Deepest condolences um, from everyone here at Closing Arguments and Court TV. Um, let's start by, by getting to know Patrick a little bit. For the folks who never had the opportunity to meet your son or see those incredible performances. Patrick was extremely energetic, knew a lot of people, constantly made people laugh and smile. That's how a lot of people knew him. He was always saying something funny. Patrick loved to fish and race and fishing. He's won fishing tournaments. Um, he was kind to people. He called me one uh, time that he was in Nashville and said, Mama, I bought turkeys and took them to the homeless shelter. He had a great passion 
for dance, for artistry, for makeup. And he wanted to pursue that on many levels. He was extremely good at what he what he did. I got to see him perform and I was just in awe that my my baby had mastered such a craft. And I always wondered how could I market him? How can I get him out there? But he was very, very happy with that passion and pursuing that passion. Move to Music City. I want to bring Erica Morse into the conversation tonight. Erica, um, your thoughts. This case is now seven years old. Um, some information that we gleaned from the, the report uh, from WTVF seems that he, he, he knew his attacker. I would suspect so. Um, first of all, Glenda, my my condolences, my just my heart goes out to you, um, and kudos to you for sticking this out and and fighting for some answers. Um, absolutely, someone knows uh, more than they're saying. The you know, thirty years in the entertainment business, there are two things I learned. Number one, Music City is the most competitive market in the country when it comes to trying to get ahead. And number two, when you get big overnight you end up attracting some obsessed individuals. Um, I'm not sure if this was a spurned partner or if this was a jealous competitor or if this was someone who had an obsession and may have been rejected, but it is clear that Patrick knew his, um, his killer. And mom, I would suggest very strongly that um, you and those helping you in your efforts, not just you, um, reach out to your local radio stations because I can tell you that people in that field talk. There are a lot of rumors, and I firmly believe that people have heard rumors, and you can you can start from there and really try to hone in on who did this. I will do. I will focus on that. Jo Joseph Scott Morgan, your, your thoughts tonight. Um, there is a scene. It, it seems like there should be some forensic evidence to at least give a foundation for this uh, for this investigation. Uh, yeah, I, I believe that there there is, and Ms. Bonds, my, my condolences. Uh, and I have to think, uh, Vin, that, uh, you know, you're talking about somebody that felt very comfortable with going to this location. There's no signs of forced entry. So that means that this individual had the ability to access through the door, I would assume, either via key that they possessed or uh, they drew Patrick to the door, and then the door perhaps was shut behind them. Now, one of the things that's very interesting about this, this is not, as, as, as was mentioned in the report, this is not just a single gunshot wound. This is multiple gunshot wounds, which is an indication to me that this is a passion-driven event, perhaps, uh, that someone wanted to guarantee that Patrick had passed. And so they're going to leave behind a tremendous amount of evidence. I wonder, if this was a semi-automatic weapon that was used, did they take time to pick up shell cases? They felt very comfortable in this environment. If you fire off one, one round, somebody might say, well, I don't know what that was. You fire off two or three or four, you're gonna get noticed at that point in time. And I think that's probably what drew the attention of the witness that saw the individual running away from there. So I would, you know, and I'm sure Nashville has looked at this as far as intimates in his circle. But again, as was mentioned, um, he's got an intense spotlight on him. Uh, people are watching him all of the time. There's so many eyes on him. So uh, I would look for somebody that has been involved with this level of violence before. Glenda, let, let me ask you, um, what are investigators telling you? And has there been any level of, of movement or recent leads in the case? There has been no recent leads in the case. Um, I was told that the ballistics pulled from his body matches a stolen gun that was reported uh, a week or two, I think, before he died. They have linked that gun to a person that did not know him. However, they reported the gun found after the killing. Um, and I was told that if they bring them the trial that that would cause reasonable doubt, which means we can never try them again, even after a confession. I'm not 
quite sure how true that is. I don't know the law exactly. But they do have two people in mind who links to that gun that matched the ballistics in Patrick's body. They're waiting for them to make a mistake and maybe commit a, another crime to make a deal with them of some sort. I understand all of that. I'm not satisfied with it, but I understand. I don't want them to leave court uh, after reasonable doubt has been uh, handed down and say, yeah, I killed him, and we can't take him back to trial. I do understand that. But it just seems like I wish there was something else, some way to get around it, uh, to bring them forward uh, before the judge. Um, to let them know we know it was you guys or we think it was. I know that's not going to win in a court of law. But just some acknowledgement that we do have them as suspects high on the list. Absolutely. Well, Glenda, again, thank you for joining us. Our, our thoughts are with you. And we will stay on the story. We don't do it once and then forget about it. No, we'll come back and you'll be getting calls from us again and again and again until you get the justice that you uh, deserve and, and that your son deserves. Uh, thank you so much. Erica Morris, Joseph Scott Morgan, appreciate uh, your time and insight as well. Uh, when we come back, um, we're going to bring in our officers. It'll be crime time right here on Closing Arguments. A tense, tense, testy little back and forth when we return.
It is crime time here on Closing Arguments. Let's bring in tonight's guests. Joining me, former New York City Assistant Commissioner, former NYPD Sergeant Special Assignment, Dr. Keith Taylor. Keith served for 26 years as a public safety professional. He has supervised internal affairs, missing persons, emergency service unit, and federal emergency management agency, urban search and rescue teams. And he is an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Law, Police, Science, and Criminal Justice Administration at John Jay College. Also with us, former gang homicide detective Donald Schweitzer. Donald was a police officer for 10 years. He's investigated gang homicides as a detective, served as a member of the SWAT unit, and worked various narcotics assignments. Welcome to you both. Um, tonight, I, I came across this video out of uh, Pasco County, Florida. It's a, it's a traffic stop, but things get a little testy between the motorist who lives in the neighborhood that he's trying to get into and the officer who, who stops him momentarily, then stops him again. So what I want to do with you, it's, it's, a, it's a long video. So I want to play for a couple minutes, and then as the video is, is playing, I want to bring you guys in to get a little bit of reaction to what is happening, just to give us a little, little more context as to why things are going the way they're going. So uh, without any further ado, uh, this is from the Pasco County Sheriff's Office. Uh, it's a tense traffic stop. Right, what are we doing here? Where's your house? Right up there on Kitten Trail. Okay, where? See the curve? Yes. Just past the curve on the left. Is it before? Is it north of Little Beat Court? Yes. Okay. I just drove all the way around to get here. Okay. Well, I don't know that. Well, I'm explaining it to you now. I know. Can you. I go or not? Yeah. Get the hell out. Thank you. See you later. Get back in your car. Get back in your car right now. I'm telling you right now, get back in your car. Oh, you gonna shoot me? You come out of your car at a traffic stop, you offer you. Obviously, it's a dangerous situation. Get back in your car. What'd you stop me for? License, registration, you stop me and for? insurance. What'd you stop me for? License, reason for the stop. You'll find out as soon as I have your information. Supervisor. License, registration, and insurance. I Video will... all you want. You're free. I have I the body cam since I yeah, stopped you in the first place. It doesn't disappear. It's, it's yeah. public record. I know it's public record. But License, registration, and insurance. What's the reason for the stop? You fail to yield to a police barricade. You screech in your tires as you leave. You're driving fast. You're obviously frustrated. Yeah. So I'm asking for your license, your registration, and the insurance on a lawful legal stop. Okay. And you're failing to and provide I'm, any identification. I'm, I'm not failing to provide. I'll okay, it's it been you. handed to me. All right. Can I request a supervisor before I hand it to you? You can hand me the information first before you start failing to provide your identification. Supervisor, please. Did you get picked on as a kid? In school? Donald Schweitzer. Quick on comment here on, on what's going on here. Well, Vinny, uh, the officer probably should have kept this gentleman out of the car because he's in a situation where he's got the power. He's behind the wheel. He could drive off. When he was out of the car, the officer was more safe. But most of all, Vinny, you don't act this way, even if you think that the officer has pulled you over wrong for wrong reasons. The best way to get out of this situation is just comply and then drive away. He's just stirring the pot here. Dr. Keith Taylor, it, it, he, it, the, the officer waved him ahead and then decided to pull him over because um, he said he kind of screeched his tires on the way out. Uh, do you think it was that or the attitude? Uh, I, well, think I think it's it a little both. bit of both, yes. Uh, I, I think it was, it was definitely both. Uh, the, the, the driver was trying to, quote unquote, push the buttons of the officer, get him annoyed. Well, well let me ask but you this. Let me ask you this. Sure. Um, does he have a right to do that? I mean, you, can, you, can, you can't pull someone over because you're angry, right? You have to have a, a, a basis for it. Um, so how do, how do those two issues play together? Uh, so, yes, that's right. You, you're supposed to have a thick skin as a police officer. You're not supposed to react to uh, slights or insults uh, that, that individuals may give you on the street or in vehicles. But if that... The, if that behavior is combined with, say, reckless driving, then the officer uh, can act on that. And the screeching of the tires, the, the driving 
you know, erratically would might indicate that there is something else that the officer has to, to pursue or right. investigate. Let's listen in a little bit more here. I think we have a few more seconds left. Break traction. I hope you got that on camera because I'll see you in court. And when he hit the thing, I completed my stop. And he gets out with an attitude. You don't see the patrol car? No, obviously I so, see it. I didn't crash into it. Well, the part is that you can't drive around the barricade to begin with. This is retaliatory because I gave him an attitude. He wouldn't have done this if I didn't give him an attitude. Well, I appreciate you bringing the level down. It helps me some because I'm like fuming right now that he did that. Well, yeah, here's your information. All right, here's your license. Why Man, what give you, you this to information? Be a cop Drive around on a detour barricade. It's 164 dollars. Fantastic. Good. You have 30 days planning? to basically pay it or take care of it. Fantastic. Am I signing? You're also got. Uh, Am I signing? You also got any information? Am I signing? Or start or park, stop standing. Do I need it's to sign? You're all set. Have a good day. Yeah. You're all set. Yeah, I don't want you to talk yourself into handcuffs. Have a good day. Take care. Take care. I said. All right, Donald Schweitzer. Give me about 30 seconds worth of analysis here. Yeah, you know, for the police to pull people over, they just need a reasonable suspicion that a crime has occurred, is occurring, or is about to occur. A lot of people call that probable cause. In this case, the officer said that he, this guy drove around the police barricade. They had a reason to stop him. At that point, who's in control here? Is it the officer or the passenger or the driver of the car? The driver should have just obeyed the law and not given him lift. Dr. Keith Taylor, unfortunately, we're out of time uh, tonight, but uh, always appreciate you. Thank you so much. Detail of Donald Schweitzer. Uh, when we come back, folks, we have uh, something else. We need a little help from you tonight in finding a missing child.